The next session involves two uh, philanthropists as well as a, uh, someone from the US Army and the uh, NIST of the um, US government. So uh, I'm Marta Belcher. I'm very lucky to be outside general counsel to Protocol Labs. Uh, Protocol Labs is a company that researches, develops, and deploys improvements to internet technology and open source is really at the heart of everything we do. So I'm really excited to be here today. Um, as the company thought about our response to COVID-19, we knew that our direct contribution to response efforts was going to be pretty limited um, because fundamentally we're not a biotech company, um, but we are firmly committed to supporting open innovation. And one of the things that we do to support the open source community is to give out open source grants to fund research in areas of interest to the company, like distributed systems and cryptography. So PL decided in March that it would give up to $200,000 in individual grants, up to $20,000 each through our COVID-19 Open Innovation Grants Program. Uh, we received 55 applications and we selected 10 projects, which were a combination of open source hardware and software projects. Uh, so for example, we funded some open source platforms for medical device design and for COVID-19 response, uh, an open source ventilator related software project and open source ventilator hardware projects. Um, one of the most important criteria for us uh, was that whatever progress or outcomes these grants were funding would be dedicated to the public domain or released under a permissive open source license. Um, and in the few minutes I have, I wanted to talk a little bit about why we think it's so important that innovation in this space be open source. Um, of course, we're an open source company, so we think everything should be open source, um, but we think that open source can be particularly helpful for the specific challenge that you all are talking on, about here. Um, uh, as others have said, uh, Robert in particular, uh, from a practical perspective, open source offers the ability to turn a problem into modules and have teams and individuals across the globe work on the pieces that they are most equipped to handle or most interested in. And within each of those modules, um, it also allows different teams to try different approaches, solve the same problem simultaneously. So rather than one team trying different approaches, one after the other, all approaches can happen simultaneously. And um, we think parallel, parallelizing a problem is really important uh, in an area where time, of, time is of the essence. Um, and it's not just about working faster, it's of course also about working better. Um, as, I, as, as all of you know, um, open source allows you to harness collective intelligence and really turn a small team into a global powerhouse, um, which I think has been demonstrated already today with just the incredible folks um, you know, in this Zoom room uh, you know, presenting and collaborating. Um, it really allows you to tap into a well of cognitive surplus and, and utilize others' uh, spare brain cycles. Um, fundamentally, open source software and hardware is peer reviewed it's had more eyes on it and it's ultimately more reliable um, and when you're talking about medical devices of course quality is key um, we also think that this is a unique point in time where the traditional incentive structure that justifies proprietary thinking shouldn't apply um, backing up to the big picture uh, i'm an intellectual property attorney by training um, the core purpose of intellectual property is to incentivize innovation uh, the idea is that r d is expensive so you grant people a temporary monopoly on their invention so that they can charge monopoly prices and recoup the cost of their investment. And the idea is that that incentivizes them to make the investments in the first place. And it also incentivizes them to disclose their inventions to the world rather than keeping their breakthroughs a secret. Um, and ironically, when people push that narrative, uh, some of the classic examples of inventions that allegedly require IP protection are medical devices, um, specifically because it can require so much upfront investment. Um, but there are other ways of incentivizing innovation, as it turns out. Uh, the, the way that canned food was invented is that Napoleon needed a way to improve food preservation so that he could march across Russia. So he offered a prize. Um, and, and, and that's sort of what we wanted to do with our COVID-19 open innovation grants is provide funds uh, so that people don't need IP monopolies to innovate and so that they can innovate in ways that are open source and allow them to tap into collective intelligence and solve these pressing problems fast and with peer review. Um, and I think fundamentally, if there's any group that understands that incentives don't need to come from IP monopolies, uh, it's this group. Uh, you're all here because this is a moment in time where we all have an intrinsic motivation uh, to innovate in this space uh, in order to save lives. Um, so thank you all, um, and thank you so much for having me. This has been this has been really a fantastic uh, event.
Okay, thank you very much, Marta. I'm afraid we don't have a lot of time. Jokai, are you ready to go? Let's do it. <clears throat> okay, uh, so let me introduce Jokai Bin Avi. Maybe I'm not pronouncing that correctly from the Mozilla Open Source Support Foundation. Take it away. Thanks so much for having me and uh, for all the work that all of you are doing to help caregivers and the world during this pandemic. Um, so you may be wondering, what's a guy from my favorite browser company doing talking at a ventilator conference? Um, I think Mozilla has long believed in the power of open source technology to better the internet and the world. And, and by its nature, as, as Marta was just talking about, you know, open source technology development enables good ideas to be remixed and reused rapidly, um, allowing those good ideas to scale and be deployed where they're needed most. And it's been inspiring to see so many open source developers step up and collaborate on solutions to increase the capacity of healthcare systems around the world to cope with this crisis. And I think like many companies and philanthropies, we asked ourselves, you know, how, how can we best help to respond to the pandemic? Um, there's obviously tremendous need right now. Um, and it's always hard to focus on anything else when people are, are literally dying. But I think you also have to find a connection with what you know, what you have the infrastructure to support and the communities you seek to serve. Um, since 2015, we've been running the Mozilla Open Source Support Program, which uh, I'm privileged to lead, which broadens access, increases security and empowers users by providing catalytic support to open source technologists. And as an open source project ourselves, Mozilla wants to give back to the community that we come from. Um, but we also want to support projects out in the world that are advancing Mozilla's mission. And to be totally honest, at first we were like, well, is this like, is this really in our wheelhouse? And I think it was really seeing the many open source ventilator projects popping up around the world as you know the pandemic started to make headlines um, that made us think that there actually may be a role for us here. And while we're not medical experts, we do know a lot about open source development. And because we're a project of the Mozilla Corporation, um, rather than a, a sort of traditional 501c3 foundation, we're actually already set up to give money to different types of actors, whether you're you know, a traditional NGO or a for-profit company or a globally distributed you know, group of developers you know, connecting just over GitHub and Zoom without any legal entity. Um, so very natural to extend our existing Mozilla open source support grants program um, which has always looked for impact beyond the browser. And so uh, we launched the, excuse me, Moss COVID-19 Solutions Fund, handing out awards of up to $50,000 each to open source projects which are responding to the pandemic in some way. And so through this fund, we've been able to support folks like Rob and the, the Ventmon team to build their open source ventilator testing suite, um, but also projects like Recidivis, which provides a tool to help jail administrators and government officials to decrease prison populations, um, which is critical because it's effectively impossible to physically distance in most prison settings. Um, and therefore, there's a very high rate of infection um, or high risk, I should say. I, I want to sort of transition for a minute, like rapid response funding is almost always difficult. Um, and so I thought I would focus the rest of uh, my brief presentation on sort of um, some thoughts on our approach to the COVID-19 Solutions Fund, uh, which might be helpful for the folks in the audience who are working in philanthropy, but also might be helpful for those of you who are working on projects looking for grant funding to get a sense of how folks like me who lead philanthropic programs tend to think about these things. Um, and so here are sort of five thoughts, observations on our approach. Um, one, you know, at Moss in general, we try to, in our grant making, to make catalytic investments. That serves to say, we want to give you money that will help you to sort of up-level your work or that will prove sort of transformational in some way, really allow you to get to that next level. Um, and in that spirit, one of our committee members said she wanted to invest in high leverage projects where we're not just funding one project, but helping a much larger community. Um, and so, you know, I think Ventmon is a great example of that where, this is a project that we can invest and in, we can support that is supporting the capacity of a number of other different projects, as well as caregivers in hospital settings to sort of test out a ventilator that they may not be as familiar with and have confidence in it. Um, two, I think there's a lot of need out there. So find the spot where the needs intersect with your expertise and mission. For us, that's supporting open source software development um, and, and hardware development, I should say too. Um, 
I think if you normally make clothing, make masks like that, that sort of fits. Um, but it turns out like it's, it's a lot more difficult to build a ventilator than a lot of people thought. Um, and so, you know, you want to find some kind of nexus with your expertise, your resources. I think three is don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, we've had a great experience bringing in some outside medical experts to help us evaluate the application. We've received uh, more than 160 applications from 30 countries, and we had some great medical experts helping us to sort of take a look at that. And I think there are a lot of experts out there who can't do the things that you can do, um, but are looking to do their part. And providing you with some advice can be that their way of doing their part. Um, Four, I think we were looking to support projects that are, are already connected to affected communities um, and or hospital systems. It's hard to have impact quickly during this moment if you're coming in with a sort of, if I build it, they will come kind of attitude. I think we're, we were looking for folks who are on the front lines. So well, I should say, you should be looking for folks who are on the front lines um, and you know, build connections with them, figure out what they need. What can you do that's additive that can be deployed quickly and helps the ecosystem as a whole to cope better? And I think that speaks to, to Rob's point about modularization earlier. Um, five, I think during one of the prep calls for this conference, I was asked, should a project pivot if the needs have changed, even if that's not what I was funded for? And my short answer is yes, but talk to your program officer first. Um, a little bit longer answer is, I know it can feel scary to talk to a program officer, especially when things are not going according to plan, but generally program officers are genuinely nice people who are invested in you having impact. And like many philanthropic programs, we've reached out to all of our awardees to let them know we're happy to be flexible um, on the deliverables in our agreements. If you're a philanthropic program, I highly recommend you do that if you haven't done so already. And if you're a grantee, I always recommend you proactively reach out to your program officer, explain the situation, help them to understand either what you're, how you're responding to the needs that are changing on the ground and or what your team are going through, right? Like this is also affecting us as, as people too. Um, okay. And finally, um, I just wanna thank you all for all that you do. That's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, one question you might answer in the Slack yeah. is are the grants Still open, and I'm going to try to get uh, Dr. Griffer uh, set up now. Dr. Griffer, are you with me? Are you on the call? I am. Okay, I'm going to begin <laughs> sharing your slides now, and we okay. will go through your uh, presentation. And I'm afraid you, uh, like everybody else, only have five minutes. So please carry no on. Okay. Very good. Uh, and so maybe thanks for, introduce yourself, please. I will do that. Uh, thanks so much for, for the invitation to contribute to this conversation. Um, my background sort of pushed me into the nexus of uh, this response to the pandemic, as well as, um, as, well as follow on. I was for some 25 years, researcher in the European Union uh, in several different countries. I later became adjunct professor of medicine at Wayne State School of Medicine, the Center for Molecular Medicine and Genetics, which is the third largest school in, in the U.S., and, uh, and then went into the auto industry where I was the chief scientist for Daimler Chrysler and Fiat Chrysler. And currently, I'm the associate director of cyber physical systems at, uh, at NIST. That phrase may, may be puzzling to some people. Uh, I would say it's equivalent to the Internet of Things with a focus on the interaction between software and, uh, and physical systems. So what I'm going to talk about today uh, is very much uh, related to what these last speakers, including uh, Eric, uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, the problems that in this response were the basis for what I'm going to show you. I was asked some eight weeks ago uh, to assist the automotive industry, both in Europe and the United States in building ventilators. I'd like to dispel that rumor right away. And I'm going to share with you some of the conclusions that came with my working with their chief officers uh, who were in charge of their response uh, to the need for, for expanding the production of ventilators. Just one comment that relates to what Eric said. Um, most of those um, global chief manufacturing officers of those automotives that have 
uh, ventilator uh, production par partners. Uh, they predict a glut of, um, of ventilators about July timeframe. Uh, but I would remind everyone that the other remarks others have made is critical. The quality level uh, varies greatly. If you go to the next slide, uh, what we came out of this, what I came out with the team uh, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, part of the U.S. Department of Commerce, is that this was about supply chain, uh, the response or the lack thereof. Uh, there are uh, five components to what I'm going to show you, adaptive redesign, guided integration, intelligent supply, demand anticipation, and trust networks. So we have gathered together partners, which I'll explain to you who they are, uh, including Amazon, Google X, uh, Cisco, and a variety uh, of people who are in that supply chain for ventilators and, uh, and created an architecture for a system that's being stood up as we speak. If you go to the next slide and jump to uh, slide uh, number four, challenge I think is a, uh, apparent to everyone. What might not be apparent is the fact that this surge in demand for some things, while a lack of demand for others uh, is uh, is something that's going to uh, Edward, persist. Yeah. Uh, what is the title of the slide I should be on? Uh, it's number four, and it says challenge and approach. Okay. Got it. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I won't repeat the challenge, but I will remind everyone that it is about uh, a recovery phase and may very well be a, a revolution in, in how we uh, procure and, and supply. If you go to number five, Robert, uh, yes. adaptive redesign, I won't read the text for you. You can read it. Uh, the diagram was an early pencil drawing from Ford Motor Company uh, proposing the use of a blower motor and blower from an F-150 truck a seat air, air conditioning unit uh, as a substitute for a blower motor in a ventilator. Uh, this should bring up all sorts of red flags, and I'll return to that. But the point is that you do need to broaden the supply chain in order to find potentially compatible uh, designs for various parts and be able to redesign. Slide number six, Robert. Guided integration, I'll simply point out that the partners that I'll mention to you have literally uh, uh, tens of millions of two and 3D drawings available, uh, freely available to help in the design and packaging uh, is a part of that, hence the drawings. Slide number seven, Robert. Intelligent supply. So uh, by that, I mean only that, uh, as someone pointed out earlier, if a sensor, an oxygen sensor, for example, widely used in a number of industries cannot be delivered on time, uh, if there are transport uh, capabilities or capacity that's not used, uh, that needs to be brought online. Slide number eight, uh, demand anticipation. All of these pieces brought together in a platform, which I'm going to show you the architecture of, uh, is currently able to anticipate demand and regionalize that demand. Very important to a response that's affected. Slide number nine, trust is one of the things that's lost in the course of expanding that supply base along any level or tier of supplier. Uh, the partner IBM in this case brings under its blockchain practice uh, the ability to inject trust through its blockchain technologies. Skip uh, slide number 10. I'll talk about how it's implemented and go to slide number 11. The action plan that was uh, hatched at that time, once I had conferred with the leaders of the automotive partners to the ventilator industry, was to simply amplify individual efforts. So one-offs were being created by states, Connecticut, Nevada, and I'm sure countries in Europe and Asia. Uh, these one-offs were matching of potentially usable parts uh, in the production of ventilators. This needs to be brought uh, into a distributed platform Central elements, timeliness, of course. Sustainable economics, everyone needs to get paid, put it simply. And resilience, which, by the way, is not something that has over the last 20 to 30 years in supply chains been rewarded. 
uh, resilience requires a different kind of thinking. Slide number 12. There are many pieces to this puzzle, but I will jump over this, this parts list. Suffice it to say that there is a, a platform which is distributed, Amazon-like, uh, if you would, and many others. Uh, you need interfaces, you need data that corresponds to the, the things that are required in order to deliver that final product uh, to the healthcare provider. You need intelligent AI-enabled search uh, because uh, the decision uh, to, to choose a supply chain configuration has to meet those original requirements and a variety of best-of-breed tools. Slide Edward, number 13. Unfortunately, Edward, I have to ask you to conclude in one minute, please. Okay. So uh, I will conclude then with, uh, with this drawing, which basically describes a very distributed approach to bringing supplier, shipper, manufacturer, distributor, and design capabilities into a single configuration uh, quickly and intelligently, as well as payment systems. So if you'll skip, uh, Robert, to slide number 15, you may have to tab multiple times. I'll uh, simply review some of the partners involved. Google X, sort of advanced development on the Google side. IBM itself with a rapid supplier connect. Deloitte uh, supply platform, which uh, injects logistics services. The Business Roundtable and the National Association of Manufacturers. Thomas, which is a parts supply and offer uh, site, which expanded for COVID response under this paradigm. Reapley in cooperation with academics in Chicago, Constep in Connecticut, and finally several elements of US government agencies. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm terribly sorry to have to be rude to such esteemed uh, guests, but we need to get on to Kristen from the Army Materiel Command. Uh, I'm afraid I probably can't do a good job introducing you. Um, I know you're an Iraq veteran who was a med medic, but other than that, I don't know anything about you, and I'm afraid you only have about five minutes, so could you please begin, Joan? Uh, Kristen, thank you. All right. Well, good morning or good day, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you all so much for the opportunity to talk to you all today. Um, as Robert mentioned, my name is Kristen Jones Maya, and I work at the U.S. Army Medical Material Development Activity, or USAMDA for short, because it's easier to say, as a product manager. Um, USAMDA is a part of the Medical Research and Development Command that's on Fort Detrick and Frederick, Maryland. If you could go to the next slide, please. So before I get started, I wanted to state that I have no financial or intellectual equities to disclose, and the views expressed today are my own and not necessarily those of the U.S. Army, the DOD, or the U.S. government. I am also not a representative of the FDA, nor am I a clinician. Um, however, I was a combat medic in the Army during the early years of Operation Iraqi Freedom, and I've recently participated in a variety of DOD response efforts related to ventilators. I currently work, as I mentioned before, at USAMDA as a product manager, and I develop future medical capabilities for the Army. Part of this work entailed working within the FDA's regulatory framework in order to field solutions. Um, so kind of taken all together, I hope this helps to provide some context for the perspective that I am sharing with you today. Next slide, please. So as I've participated on various efforts over these last several weeks, it has become apparent that there are similarities between this situation and the future fight that medically we are preparing for. Um, first, we saw a surge in demand and corresponding supply shortfalls and key items needed to effectively manage the COVID caseload. One of the first was ventilators, but the same situation has played out on multiple fronts. We also saw field hospitals being set up in unlikely places like convention centers and even the open spaces of park, uh, quickly converting these spaces to functioning hospital wards despite not really being designed for that intent. The same creativity, flexibility, and resiliency that have been paramount during these response efforts will also be needed to treat and manage casualties in the future from an Army perspective. Strategically speaking, that future fight will not look like the last two decades of conflict and from a medical perspective, it certainly won't be business as usual um, and will require greater agility on our part. We won't have a reliable resupply of critical items and patient movement is going to be significantly hampered. 
Casualties will have to be kept in aid station-like settings for longer periods of time, and field hospitals will have to be mobile in a way that they aren't now. The days of quickly evacuating casualties to a field hospital and then out of theater will be gone. So altogether, medical resources and facilities could quickly become overrun, a situation that is not that different than some of the circumstances around COVID-19. What we have learned from being forced to do things differently now helps us to prepare to treat our wounded in that future fight. Next slide, please. So of those lessons I mentioned, I've listed four-ish important characteristics of any solution that we put forth in the military, and I felt it certainly could apply here to ventilators. Rugged devices are probably obviously important for the military, but it's a quality that certainly adds value during response efforts as hotspots move and change and resources have to follow demand. An item that can easily stand up to being used, packed up and shipped over and over again is critical, um, which also kind of leads to the next one, which is reliability. Devices that don't need frequent calibration and don't break quickly or easily and can run and run and run can do wonders for mitigating resource shortages. Um, the next two on the list are two of my favorite, in part because it's the primary yardstick by which I measure most potential solutions in my day-to-day -day work. Um, first, I like to talk about simplicity. A solution that is simple implies a few things in my mind. One, for the end user, is it straightforward and easy to use? In the Army, medics are a vast majority of the workforce. If you can put forth a solution that the majority of your workforce can use, that is clearly preferable over something that only a specialist can do. But simplicity can also be a design consideration. A simple design might not, might not only be easier to use, but it might also be more reliable and potentially more rugged. Last, and I'd argue most importantly, is effectiveness and safety. All the ruggedization, reliability, and simplicity in the world won't get you far if the device doesn't provide the intended and needed clinical benefit, all without risking the patient and even provider safety. So while I argue for the importance of safety and effectiveness, these other key considerations need to be brought concurrently into the design process and, and properly balanced. And before I wrap up, I would be remiss I didn't say something about the FDA clearance and approval. Um, in the military, every solution that gets pushed out needs to have that regulatory clearance and approval. And so just as we can't ignore this critical piece in our middle, middle, ugh, military medical product development, um, we also can't ignore it when we're looking at innovative ways of responding to this pandemic. Um, and I watch this has been a really hard lesson for some folks who have tried to contribute in this space to, to work through. Uh, last slide, please. And so I just want to say thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to speak today and share some of my thoughts. And I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid we don't have any direct questions. This is almost certainly my fault for trying to pack four speakers into one session, making it impossible to uh, uh, do that. But thank you, all of you. Um, we now need to go on to Dr. Sarah Benson-Conforti.